a zero emission economy. But there is one bottleneck in the production of batteries that unless solved will undoubtedly kill this dream. As we move away from the days of coal and gas powered power plants and welcome the days of large scale battery stores for both renewables and other, and other consumer electronics such as electric cars, we need to consider the supply chain and production of electric vehicles in order to meet this rising demand. In fact, the market from battery storage is expected to grow from $22.99 billion in 2021 at a compound annual growth rate of 16.2%, hence reaching $38.32 billion by the end of 2025. This is hundreds of times faster than the potential growth of the grizzly bear population. So with that in mind, let's explore both the engineering, economics, and sustainability of the electric car battery future. Before I begin, a little bit about myself if you're new here. Hello, my name is Joaquin Ravello. I am a freshman at the University of Pennsylvania studying business at Warden and engineering at Penn Engineering. All right, with that being said, if you enjoy this video, please give it a share, give it a like. I really appreciate it and the algorithm does as well. All right, so electric vehicle batteries. So throughout this video, we're gonna be focusing on the electric vehicle batteries of both Tesla as well as those of other competitors. Let's start by investigating the general case of how EV batteries work. These batteries work by using two parallel plates, a positive plate, also known as the cathode, and a negative plate, also known as the anode. Separating these two plates is a material known as the electrolyte, whose main purpose is to transport charge from one side of the plate to the other. In lithium ion batteries, the positive charge transported from plate to plate is known as lithium ions, which contain a plus one charge as we can see in the periodic table. And here's the interesting part, so make sure you're paying attention. So essentially, if the lithium ions are able to transport all the way to the cathode, we see that we create a potential difference between the two plates, a difference between the lithium ions and the electrons. These irons are stored inside of a layer structure of the cathode, which tends to be graphite with the weak van der Waal forces keeping the ions inside of the geometric spaces of the cathode. Therefore, if we connect a load, such as an induction motor between both the anode and the cathode, we get a current generated as the positive lithium ion cathode is attracting the electrons. And then, in order to charge this battery, we can just simply apply the voltage in reverse. By applying a negative voltage, we are essentially moving the electrons back to the anode where they started. This creates an electric potential in the anode that is sufficient to overcome the van der Waal forces caused by the lithium ions. Through this, we now see that we are at our starting state, and thus the chemical reaction that created the current in the first place can begin again. Lithium is being used because it is the lightest metal, giving it a fantastic energy to weight characteristics. And graphite is normally used as the area for these lithium ions to park into. However, Tesla has been looking into silicon alternatives instead, but it comes at the cost of increasing volume. Thus, if one adds silicon instead, we see that while we do get six times more lithium storage capacity than graphite, the silicon expands four more times which puts unnecessary stress on the battery. From this, it's important to note that the anode and cathode simply act as storage bins for the lithium ions to sit between. The anode and cathode are not made of pure, pure lithium in any way. In fact, only 7% of an EV battery is made from lithium. However, these batteries are slowly degraded and damaged through each use case. This damage comes from the lithium reacting with the electrons, which essentially creates a solid layer, known as the solid electrolyte interface, which decreases the amount of lithium ions being stored in the surface area. Regarding the mechanical design of the battery, Tesla has been working with Panasonic to create a new generation of batteries, also known as the 4680. These batteries are known to create a tabless design, which deviates from their previous design. In fact, Panasonic only recently debuted this technology with Tesla debuting it in their battery event in 2020. These batteries will be manufactured at Tesla's new Gigafactory, with Tesla needing to produce as many batteries in-house in order to keep up with their ambitious goals of producing 20 million cars per year by 2030. That's the same as producing 363 times the grizzly bear population per year. It's important to note here that Tesla is still working with Panasonic, 
but is becoming less reliant on them as Tesla wants to control as much of the production as possible. Regardless, the design of the battery is known as the tabless battery design, which, as you guessed it, is a battery without any tabs. These tabs are essentially small leads that carry current into or out of the cathode and the anode. Instead, if we were to spread out the cylindrical battery, we get a rectangular surface area for both the cathode and anode, similar to a capacitor. The entire top edge of the rectangle is instead cut into many small tabs, which spans the entire length of the rectangle. Then the tabs are folded into each other, which essentially creates a small plane that acts as one big tab. This is the advantage of increasing power storage by roughly six times while increasing energy storage by another five times and improving range by 16%, according to the initial estimates. Why is this? It's because the electrons encounter a smaller resistance as they have to travel laterally up the length of the battery to get to the tabs rather than across the circumference of the battery to reach a singular tab. Using the basic resistance formula, we see that a larger path traveled results in a larger resistance. In other words, the length traveled is directly proportional to the resistance experienced. Thus, if we were to decrease the resistance, we see that we get less power dissipated, as seen from the standard P equals IR squared formula. However, the largest advantage with using these tabless batteries has everything to do with their manufacturing cost and manufacturing speed. These costs have decreased from a 20% cost per kilowatts, while the manufacturing speed increases dramatically as we do not have to stop the manufacturing process to add tabs to the battery. Rather, we just fold all the tabs in one in just one very smooth action. If you're interested in the manufacturing of these lithium ion batteries, I would strongly suggest all readers read the paper that I've linked down below. This research paper details all the hurdles to efficient lithium ion battery manufacturing. And here's where one of today's opportunities lies, and that's the creation of more efficient and faster manufacturing processes. Again, I would strongly suggest you read the paper below as an introduction to the topic. As I mentioned in the previous video with the introduction of the Gigapress machine, the larger chassis has an increase in its structural stability with the new Tesla batteries actually playing an important role in improving this structural stability. In other words, these new batteries act both as a storing mechanism and as chassis support. An interesting bonus. When we look at the engineering of the new Tesla batteries, we see that these batteries will contain little to no cobalt. In fact, Tesla has stated that it's looking to replace nickel with cobalt, with the entire industry likely to follow suit in the next couple years. What's interesting here is that the batteries that have larger quantities of nickel in them are more suitable for the long range vehicles, such as the Cybertruck. And as we'll see in the next section on the economics, in order to accommodate this change towards the new generation of batteries, we need to be able to find more robust ways of extracting both lithium and nickel, which will definitely be a growing necessity for the sector moving forward. However, for the time being, we are seeing startups such as Electra Battery Materials, which is located in Canada, creating battery graded nickel and cobalt to help reduce the strain on the current volatile supply chain, which we'll see right now. So as we explore both the economics and management of the battery production, it's important to remember that Tesla is not the only stakeholder in the market. However, it does hold over 79.5% of all new EVs registered during early 2020, with that number decreasing to 66.3%. The remaining market cap is made up of mainly competitors that make your standard car company, such as the Chevys and the Audis and et cetera, et cetera, that are all transitioning towards electric vehicles. And this transition is seen in the graph below. As one might imagine, the batteries of these different EVs specifications all differ based on the design and type of electric motor, similar to the placing of the permanent magnet in the previous EV video I did. Over the next 20 years, it is predicted that there will be over 500 million electric vehicles globally. To keep up with this large electric vehicle growth, it is likely that many of the current materials and sources of producing these materials used in battery production are not a viable solution for the future due to many factors such as battery efficiency, material sourcing, etc. For instance, consider cobalt and lithium, which are key materials in our current battery designs today, which account for upwards of 30 to 40% of all battery costs. While both of these materials only make up a fraction of the total battery chemistry percent composition, they are nevertheless a large part of the cost, which is one reason why EVs are looking to have nickel make up nearly 100% of the new tabless battery designs by replacing cobalt, 
as Baglino said. In fact, the cost of batteries tend to make up upwards of 40% of the costs of electric vehicles. With the current price of Tesla's Model 3, Tesla's cheapest model, being at $35,000, while the price of a Nissan Leaf 2022 model is $27,400. Looking at growth more, we see that the price of lithium ion batteries actually fell from 1,100 kilowatt hours in 2010 to 137 kilowatt hours in 2020. As brought out in the latest forecasts, the decrease in material costs will contribute to the prices of lithium being close to $100 per kilowatt hour. In fact, the projection of the material cost of these batteries is seen in the figure below. And what's interesting here is that this figure shows the projection of the cost during 2017, where the cost of a Model 3 battery was at 190 kilowatt hours. And at that price, they were trying to hit a goal of 180 kilowatt hours, while the battery cost for General Motors was at 205 kilowatt hours. I bring this up because I find it absolutely fascinating how we've completely shattered these forecasts, as we now have costs nearing 100 kilowatt hours, which just goes to show how fast the industry is evolving. So the 2018 Model S 100D is among the cars with the largest battery storage at 100 kilowatt hours. With that said, as a result of the negative impact of the battery cost and the price of electric cars, Tesla has focused on the development of cheaper and improved electric batteries, one of which is the yet to be implemented LFP. As of October, the company is considering changing the composition of its batteries, as stated by some of Elon Musk's tweets. This change includes adding an LFP battery inside of all standard range vehicles, essentially moving away from nickel, cobalt, and aluminum. These batteries now use a lithium iron phosphate chemistry, hence LFP. The LFP batteries are theoretically cheaper than the nickel manganese cobalt cells as they do not require cobalt or nickel, which are price volatile materials. These new generation of batteries are safer and more stable than previous batteries used in Tesla vehicles. However, it is still a relatively new concept and the drawbacks will be discussed in a future video. So the manufacturing of electric car batteries can be split up into three different parts. First is cell manufacturing, then is the manufacturing of the modules, and finally is pack assembly. The processes of these three parts can all be done in the same location, such as Tesla carrying them out in their new Gigafactory in Nevada. Alternatively, the manufacturing can be divided in three different locations. An example of the production of battery cells and modules is the Automotive Energy Supply Corporation in Sunderland, serving as a joint venture between Nissan, NEC, and Token Corporation to manufacture lithium batteries. So looking at the supply chain of these batteries, we need to talk about lithium and nickel. So there are two key methods today that are used to extract lithium from sites. One of the methods is the mining and extraction of the ore. From the ore, there is then a later process that is used to extract it into lithium that can be used for batteries. This is essentially just a lithium cobalt oxide. So of the mining and extraction method, acres of rock and dirt are displaced, contributing to the disruption of nearby land. The second method is pumping underground water deposits to the Earth's surface. The briny fluid that results from this method is evaporated, with the remaining lithium being removed from the dried salt. As one can imagine, this method requires the use of large quantities of water. With that in mind, there are tons of reserves of lithium at the bottom of the ocean. However, as of right now, there is no clear method of removing that lithium. And this is a perfect opportunity for engineers to solve. However, we do need to be careful as we do not want to pollute and destroy the ocean environment, which is why there is no sufficient method developed. So looking at the supply chain, the majority of lithium is extracted from South America, but the increased demand has contributed to additional mining in Australia with predictions looking at getting all the required lithium from the United States. In other words, there are predictions that we might be able to get all of our lithium just from the states. In fact, according to Aguer, South America possesses 21 million tons of the identified 86 million tons globally, which is more than sufficient lithium for any of our battery production needs. Unfortunately though, the manufacturing of this lithium does leave a large carbon footprint, whereby 74% more carbon dioxide is produced during the manufacturing of lithium ion batteries as compared to lead acid batteries. So based on research carried on the environmental impact of lithium ion batteries, it is clear that their disposal has more negative effects than lead acid batteries. The lithium ion batteries can be recycled at 5%, with 90% of all lead acid batteries being able to be recycled, 
as of 2018. However, there is hope as there are multiple startups and incubators looking at solutions to more effectively recycle these batteries. In other words, rather than mining new lithium and nickel, one can simply recycle the lithium from used Tesla batteries, such as the startup Lee Cycle, which is doing exactly that. This is going to be crucial to reduce the amount of lithium we are mining, as we will be able to reuse the cell chemistry from previous electric vehicles. Next is nickel, with the average battery containing upwards of 700 grams of nickel per kilowatt hour, which makes up the majority of the battery's weight. In fact, the demand of nickel is expected to rise from 115,000 tons in 2020 to around 580,000 tons in 2025. And this supply chain is rather robust, spanning from Canada to Russia to China, Brazil, and Australia. In fact, a large supply of nickel is actually found in Ontario, which is likely due to a meteorite impact. There are, however, multiple negative environmental impacts with the manufacturing of nickel, such as the emission of greenhouse gases, destruction of habitats, and the contamination of water, soil, and air, such as a recent spill in the Arctic Circle. The carbon dioxide produced per ton of nickel is approximately 18 tons. In addition, the manufacturing requires massive uses of energy, as the nickel tends to be found in low-grade ores. This just means that the ores have low quantity of the desired metal. Overall, Tesla's economic goal is to reach 10 terabytes of car production by 2030. And based on the current manufacturing strategies and everything that's been done in the past few years, it is very likely that we're gonna reach this goal. So according to Elon Musk, the goal is to produce 20 million of these electric vehicles every year up until 2030 to reach this goal. As stated in my previous video, there are multiple environmental concerns with the production of electric vehicle batteries. Companies tend to use lithium ion batteries, which have an adverse effect on the environment through its manufacturing process. Lithium mining is associated with concerns of water basins contamination and the pollution of water of local communities. In fact, as stated before, Tesla does have a battery production site in Nevada and are looking for more greener alternatives to finding lithium in that state. Overall though, the emissions of the manufacturing process tends to be higher compared to those in the manufacturing of conventional cars. As stated in the previous videos, while there are many concerns with the manufacturing of the battery, these emission costs tend to be made up after a year to a year and a half of using the battery inside of an electric vehicle, rather than using a conventional gasoline powered car. On average, the electric batteries used in Tesla cars have contributed to a 38% fall in emission of carbon dioxide when the cars are in use. I know this is a pretty basic overview of the environmental impacts, um, as the majority of the negative and adverse impacts are due to the manufacturing of the lithium, which I stated previously in the economic section. And to find more stats about the negative impact of electric vehicles in general and how they compare to gasoline cars, you can find at the previous video I did on electric vehicles. So as we saw in this video, the supply chain of these batteries is the largest bottleneck in achieving green technology and sustainability in the transportation sector. And it's the transition away from gasoline powered cars and into electric vehicles that is ultimately gonna allow us to transition towards a greener society. This goes without saying that if you found this video helpful, please share it with three of your friends. Videos like these do take dozens upon dozens of hours to make. So if you do find this helpful or enlightening or entertaining or whatever it may be, please subscribe down below and share it with your friends. Any support I receive is greatly appreciated as I am studying at a very rigorous program uh, and would appreciate the support. So thank you very much for watching and until next time, keep innovating. I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.